And I'd also like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. And I always welcome the opportunity to talk with and speak with and work with teachers because you're the main ones who work with our kids, work with the children every day, day in and day out. And as an OT, I have the luxury of working with a child maybe once or twice a week, but you're the ones that see them in their natural environments in the classroom. So I just welcome this opportunity and I hope you enjoy this presentation and find it useful. So our goals for today. The main goal, the first goal, describe common characteristics of autism or ASD. And ASD stands for Autism Spectrum Disorders. Also to understand what is meant by the term sensory processing. Our second goal is to identify how sensory challenges impact a child's ability to succeed in the classroom. And finally, and the crux of our webinar tonight, is to list practical strategies and ways to modify your classroom to create an autism-friendly environment. And the reason we're talking about autism, or ASD, and sensory processing together today is because studies have shown that sensory differences are more prevalent in children with ASD than in typically developing children or in children with other developmental disabilities. And I would imagine we've all heard the most recent and most alarming statistics that the, the incidence of autism is now one in 68 children. So that said, sensory is a diagnostic criteria for autism or ASD, hyper or hypo reactivity to sensory input or unusual interest in sensory aspects of the environment. For example, an apparent indifference to pain or temperature could be adverse responses to specific sounds or textures. A child could have excess smelling or touching of objects or possibly a visual fascination with lights or movements. And these are all characteristics that accompany the sensory profile of a child with autism. So it's important to note that while sensory is a characteristic of a child with ASD or a person with ASD. These sensory differences vary greatly between individuals. And SPD is like a spectrum or a continuum. Or a continuum. And we're going to talk about that further today. However, it's important to note that not all children with sensory processing challenges or difficulties have autism. So those are our three main goals, and now we'll move into the definition of ASD or autism. Autism Speaks defines ASD as complex disorders of brain development, which are characterized in varying degrees by difficulties in four main areas. The first of those areas is social interaction. Typically developing children are social beings. They look at faces, they turn toward voices, and they even smile by the age of two or three months. By contrast, most children with autism have trouble engaging in the give and take and the back and forth of everyday human interaction. Some fail to respond to their name, some stop babbling or talking, and they may have a reduced interest in people. By toddlerhood, many children have trouble playing social games, and they might prefer to play alone and they cannot imitate the actions of others. Children with ASD have difficulty interpreting what others are thinking and feeling. Their subtle social cues of a smile or a grimace have little meaning for them. And a simple statement from a teacher such as, come here, may mean the same thing to a child, regardless of if it's said with a smile and arms extended like for a hug, or with a frown and hands on the hips. People with ASD lack the understanding that other people have different feelings, ideas, thoughts, and goals than they have. And in our preschool classrooms, this certainly impacts interactions, play skills, and turn-taking among our students. So you could see that that social interaction is a big piece of the diagnosis. The second, the nonverbal and verbal communication. 
So by the age of three, most children have achieved the typical milestones to learning language, the earliest of which is babbling. And by the age of one, most toddlers have one or two words in their repertoire. They look when their name is called and they point to the objects that they want in their environment. Children with autism tend to be delayed in babbling, learning to talk, and using gestures. Many nonverbal children with autism use communication devices or systems, such as pictures, possibly sign language, or even a speech generating device. When language does develop, they may use speech in unusual ways. They may repeat the same things over and over, either a single word or a phrase. They may use echolalia, which is repeating what they hear. And this could be something that they hear in the classroom, a conversation that they overhear at home. But quite what's typical is the child who is repeating what they're hearing from a video or what is read to them from a book. They might repeat that over and over. Other communication challenges are rooted in the difficulties in the social interactions that we just spoke about. They may have the limited ability to sustain the back and forth of a conversation. They can't dialogue, but they might be able to talk at length about one of their preferred interests, giving others no chance to add to the conversation. So it's more of a monologue than a dialogue. They may not pick up on body language or tone of voice, and they might take things very literally. Um, kids with ASD tend to be very concrete. Say if you, so if you say something like, oh, that's just great, with sarcasm, they might interpret the meaning as it's truly great when that's not what you meant at all. Similarly, they may lack a range of tone when talking. They may be very monotone or sound robot-like, which makes it difficult to interpret their needs. The presence of unusual or repetitive behaviors and a tendency to engage in a restrictive range of activities is another core symptom of autism. These may include hand flapping, jumping and twirling, rocking their bodies, repeating sounds or words, or lining up or arranging objects. Some of the behaviors may be self-stimulating, such as moving their fingers in front of their eyes or their face. And I once worked with a young boy who was fascinated and more obsessed with elevator doors. And he used to hold his hands in front of his face and he would move his hands together and apart and together and apart repeatedly. And he was simulating the elevator doors opening and closing. So can you imagine how this impacted his ability to engage or play or talk with others? These repetitive behaviors and tendency to engage in restrictive range of activities can be observed in how a child with autism plays, plays with children, plays with toys. They may spend hours lining things up in a particular way. And imagine if a peer walks up and alters the position of one of those toys, or worse yet, tries to take one of the toys. If the order is disruptive, that can be quite upsetting. So consistency in their environment is critical, and routines are very important. And we'll talk more about that when we get to transition times. The last one the comorbid physical and medical issues. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about these issues, um, but with, with children with autism, it's worth mentioning. The basic symptoms just described, the social interaction problems, the difficulties with communication, and the challenges with repetitive behaviors are often accompanied by other medical conditions and challenges that can also vary in severity. Autism Speaks outlines associated neurological issues as sleep deficits, seizures, mood disorders, anxiety, hyperactivity, and attention problems. Associated symptoms, I'm sorry, associated systemic issues uh, can be GI disorders and immune dysfunction. So on top of the challenges with those social interactions, the verbal and nonverbal communication and the repetitive behaviors, some of our kids and families have the medical issues to deal with as well. So moving on from the characteristics and definition of autism, what is sensory processing? And some of you might have also heard the term sensory integration. 
So the definition is the procedure in our central nervous system of organizing the information we take in from our bodies and the world around us for use in daily life. Sensory processing is an unconscious process of the brain. It occurs without us even thinking about it, just like breathing. It organizes information detected by our senses. It allows us to act or respond to the situation we're experiencing in a purposeful manner. And importantly, it forms the underlying foundation for academic learning and social interactions. The goal of sensory processing is to achieve and to maintain regulation, that proper state of arousal to be able to attend and focus and interact. So in more layman's terms, those fancy words of sensory processing, sensory integration, it's everything we feel or experience could be the wind blowing on our face, the smell of cookies baking in the kitchen, even driving a car down the road. All of those sensations are processed in our brain. It gives meaning to what's experienced by sifting through all of this information and selecting what to focus on, such as listening to a teacher or listening to me on this webinar, and what to ignore, such as the sound of traffic outside the window or our cell phones ringing. If a child has an unusual response, then their brain isn't processing what they feel or what they experience well. And if the brain does a poor job of integrating these sensations, this interferes with many aspects of a person's life. There will be more difficulty and more effort and less success and satisfaction. Children with SPD can be slow learners or have behavior problems. So another fancy term, those exteroceptors. These are sensations that come from outside of the body. Now, I'm sure we all learned about growing up the five typical sensations, the sense of sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Our students and all of us are bombarded by these sensations, by the sights and the smells and the sounds throughout their day. Take a minute and picture your classroom. Think about what's hanging on your walls, what's covering your floors, and what's on the shelves and in those colorful bins. Picture the sounds, the music playing in the background, the chairs sliding across the floor, the toys dropping, kids fighting or crying, the teachers talking, and then the biggest culprit of the auditory system, the toilets flushing. The touch or the tactile system is also greatly impacted in the classroom. Children bumping into each other as they move to their seats. Another child trying to take the hand of a friend to lead them to a toy. And the rich tactile experiences from the sand table, the rice and bean bin, the finger paint and the Play-Doh, or simply the feeling of the clothes against their skin. The smells of that Play-Doh and other craft materials, and the soaps and the lotions that are in the classroom. These are all sensations that our kids have to deal with every day. Our brains need to receive and organize and make sense of all this competing information. And some of us can appropriately, appropriately tune out or filter those incoming sensations and only act on the ones that we need, like the smell of a fire or the sound of a fire alarm or someone yelling for help. But many children with ASD struggle with this sensory regulation and they react to every flickering light, every noisy pencil sharpener, or people passing in the hallway. Their learning, their behavior, and their social worlds are affected. And if any of you have an OT in your life or in your classroom, which hopefully you do, you might hear the term sensory diets. And this is a term that's used often by occupational therapists, and it refers to experiences that are rich in these sensory areas. And again, the whole goal is to achieve regulation. So those are the five senses that we've all grown up knowing about. And there are also two hidden senses, senses that tell us where we are in space. The first one is the vestibular sense. This is the sense of balance and movement, which helps us to maintain an upright position and know how fast our body is moving. 
The vestibular sense has to do with balance and movement, and it's centered in the inner ear, in our vestibular organs deep inside our ears. So when we move our heads, the fluid in these organs moves and shifts, and it constantly provides us with information about the position of our heads and our bodies in space. And when this system is fully functioning, children are secure in their bodies, which allows them to attend and respond to all of the other sensory input they're receiving. They feel safe, even if their feet leave the ground. They can start and stop movements calmly and with control. They're comfortable with climbing, swinging, and somersaulting. Conversely, when a child's vestibular system is not functioning properly, they may need to move constantly to feel satisfied. Or, on that continuum again, they may be fearful of movement because they feel unbalanced. They may have difficulty coordinating and planning motor tasks to jump, skip, or catch a ball. So these movements of spinning, turning, flipping, climbing, running, these sensations all have one thing in common, movement. The next system we'll talk about is the proprioceptive sense. This is the sense of our body awareness, which gives us information about the position of our body parts without even looking at them. It also helps us to know how much force to use when picking up an object. Proprioception refers to the way that our joints and our muscles send messages to our brains to provide information about our body's positioning and movement whereas the vestibular system happens and occurs deep in our ears, this happens in every joint and muscle. This sense allows us to grade the force in the direction of our movements. For example, our bodies instinctively know to apply more effort when lifting a heavy box and less effort when picking up a light piece of paper. A well-functioning proprioceptive system allows a child to use a pencil without breaking the tip, or color with markers without putting a hole through the paper, and also taking a sip from a plastic cup without crushing it. When this system is healthy, it allows children to move and play and explore in a coordinated and efficient way, not too gently and not too rough. When a child's proprioceptive system is not functioning properly, they may need to seek additional input to their muscles and joints so that they can regulate and stay in control. These are the kids in your classroom that might be known as the rough kids because they have difficulty grading the speed and the force of their movements. They may rarely walk because they prefer to stomp or jump or run everywhere they go. They may have poor body awareness and bump into other children or even the walls or furniture as they walk and they might use too little force during fine or gross motor activities. The next thing we'll talk about is the responsivity, and I've hinted at it a little bit in talking about our seven senses. So I like to liken this, the responsivity, to cups. And like I said earlier, it's important to think of sensory processing on a continuum. Some children are more or less sensitive than others. The first category we'll talk about, or cup we'll talk about, is the sensory under-responsivity, or hypo-sensitive. These children need more and more input to stay regulated. They need more sensation to get and to feel regulated to be able to focus and interact with other people in their environment. Conversely, we have the sensory over-responding kids, or hyper-responsive. These kids, in these kids, their senses are heightened. So even a small bit of input can cause sensory overload. They might register, their systems might register a small poke or a small bump as a punch in the stomach. So in the next slide, the central nervous system. It's important to note and remember that the central nervous system is at the foundation or the root of all that we do. And the very next 
level of that pyramid is the sensory systems that we just talked about, followed by the sensory motor development, what gives us our body scheme and our postural security, what leads to motor planning and the awareness of both sides of the body. What comes next is the perceptual motor development, the skills of eye-hand coordination, auditory language skills, ocular motor control. And finally, at the top of our pyramid is the academic learning, the daily living skills, the behaviors. So this area, the cognition and the intellect, that's at the top of our pyramid. And it's essential to have a solid foundation and a solid base within our nervous system, within our senses, in order to achieve academic success. Classroom teachers have the opportunity and the challenge to meet the many needs of diverse learners. In order for all students to be ready to learn and grow, they need a sensory rich and sensory friendly environment. These provide the basis or the foundation for learning. And when the students' needs are met, they will be at their optimal internal state of feeling calm, focused, and ready. So now, how do ASD and sensory processing impact your classroom? Today we're going to focus on three common occurrences in your classroom and how to help the children with ASD and sensory processing difficulties. We can translate all of these things that we'll talk about to all of your areas in your classroom throughout the day, but I focused on these three main areas, the transition times, the circle times, and the areas the times for peer interactions. So for the transition times, some children may have difficulty moving from one activity to another, particularly moving on from a preferred activity. You may see tantrums or other behavioral outbursts. Transitions between activities or locations can be problematic. In the classroom, if you could imagine prior to the transition, the students have been maybe sitting down, listening to a story, doing some coloring, playing with some friends, and their brains and bodies have been regulated for one environment. And now we're asking them to move to something else. But moving on to that other environment requires different regulation. The transition can elicit a period of dysregulation, which may be manifest by excessive movements, hands on others, disruptive behaviors. The next time we'll talk about is circle time. A child might be under responsive in circle time. They might be trying to fill up their cup. They might be fidgety. They might be unable to sit still. They might be leaning on their neighbor or laying on the floor. Or conversely, they may be over responsive. Their cup is already overflowing, and the child next to them is making noises. The child on the other side of them is bumping into them, and the teacher is reading the book too loud. So any type of input that they're getting is going to cause, um, going to cause a disturbance in their regulation. And lastly, the peer interactions. So remember how these children, they can't read social cues or have difficulty reading social cues. They may miss the body language and be oblivious that their friend is about to cry because they took a toy away from them. They struggle with the verbal communication, so they can't tell a teacher if they don't feel well, and that's why they had an outburst during that game. So I'm sure we could all come up with dozens of more examples from each of these core classroom times. And I challenge you to think about how what you are seeing in your classroom may be related to the symptoms of ASD or difficulty with sensory processing. So let's move on and talk about some sensory strategies that might be able to help. So on this slide, there are six different classroom strategies. And I highlight these to improve transition times, but it's important to remember that several of these 
can also be used during other times in your classroom. These can easily be used for circle time. They can easily be used during peer interactions and during other times, not just the transition times that I've highlighted here. So with these particular strategies, keep in mind the seven senses that we just talked about and learned about. For our sense of vision, you can see I have the use of the visual schedules, the visual timers, the use of dim lights, or minimizing visual clutter. The auditory sense, using soft rhythmical music, and also allowing ample time for preparation prior to transition. You can be giving some auditory cues to these children, letting them know when it's about time for a transition, preparing them. And also our sense of proprioception with the use of weighted items. So I have some examples um, so of some weighted items here. Um, the one in the top middle, those are very easily handmade. These weighted items can be filled with, they can be soft pieces of felt like you see here, or they could be big athletic socks that can be filled with rice or filled with flour or filled with beads. And it provides that nice proprioceptive input. It can be put across laps, it could be carried around the classroom. There are also some fancy sensory weighted items up here. Um, something that can be found online, that can be worn around the body, worn around the neck, again, to provide some grounding or some proprioceptive input to those joints and muscles. Um, the frog backpack, it's important to remember you could use the child's regular backpack and just add some additional weight um, the child can be using the backpack not only walking into and out of the school during, at the beginning and at the end of the day. They could use it during times of transition. If you have a child who might need this additional weight, this additional proprioceptive input, you can have them wear it to and from the playground just as a means of organizing their bodies more. There are different things that can be used on the laps. Um, that could have the tactile input as well something on top of it, something rubbery, something um, that, that uses the tactile input. And also the teddy bear on the left, just an idea that the regular toys in the classroom, weights can be added to them or use of heavier things to, to get this need met. Talking about strategies for circle time. Two of the things we'll talk about are alternative seating options and fidget toys. So here's a, an example of a circle time that's going beautifully. No one's having a tantrum and no one's crying. But before we talk about the different sensory things that you can use, I want you to look around this classroom. And we talked about the visual sense. And this is a very pleasant looking classroom, but I just wanted to point out all of the different things that are hanging on the walls, and even the carpet that's used between the calendars and the alphabet and the weather chart and all of the other things that are located up on the walls. There's a lot happening visually in this classroom and it could be overwhelming to our sensory sensitive kids. So just keep that in mind as you're setting up your classroom. So just to highlight a few of our kids here, the first one, it's the second boy from the left. He's using, it's a weighted tube, so he's using that proprioceptive sense or tapping into the proprioceptive sense to have some weight around his neck, which can be grounding. It can be helping alert his postural muscles so he can sit up straighter on the floor. It's also using his tactile sense because he can be squeezing or touching the soft fabric that's around that tube. The next child that's highlighted is the fourth child from the left. He's using two sensory strategies. He's having, he has one of the weighted, the blue dog on his lap, again, using the proprioceptive sense. And he also is, he has something in his mouth. He has a fidget toy. And think about what is most calming for a newborn baby or an infant. It's that sucking sucking on a nipple, sucking on a bottle. 
And sensory diets that are rich in social input can be very calming. Um, adults use those strategies too. Um, people often use gum or chew on different things to help maintain their sense of arousal or to maintain regulation, to focus and attend on something. Uh, the, the little jiggler that this boy is using, it actually vibrates, so it has that additional input for that sense, and he also can chew on it. And the, the little girl who's closest to us on the right on the screen, she's sitting on a sit-fit cushion. This one, I believe, can be filled with beads, or it could be filled and inflated with air. And she's also using that oral strategy, too, to maintain her focus and arousal. Same thing with the girl in the red, sitting on something to get that vestibular, that subtle vestibular input, so as not to lay on the floor or roll around on the floor. She's getting that subtle input from sitting on that inflated pad. She's also using an oral motor strategy to, to use a chewy tube. The girl who's the third from the left, she's sitting on the yellow roadie, and she looks very alert and awake. She's getting that vestibular, again, that subtle vestibular input from that yellow roadie, and she's nice and alert and demonstrating an upright posture. Then we have a little girl who's sitting in the beanbag chair. Um, she's, her body is very extended, but the use of a beanbag chair can be very calming, particularly if it has less things in it. It can be a very uh, calming environment, a calming space for a child who might need that. The last two children we're highlighting here, um, the little girl who's wrapped in the red lycra. So she can climb in here, and think about another thing that's most calming for infants or babies. It's that swaddling. So that's very calming and soothing for our sensory systems. So we can utilize this strategy or simulate that swaddling with our preschoolers. They can be put in, in pieces or climb in pieces of lycra and with their legs, with their limbs, with their hands pushing against the lycra, their, their bodies, their muscles and their tendons are getting that proprioceptive input, again, for that calming and regulation. And finally, we have the little boy with the glasses who's seated in a rocking chair. So he has the additional um, physical boundaries of that high back and the arms to help him stay upright and focused. And he can also utilize the rocker component of the rocking chair for that vestibular input. I also included some other alternative seating options. Some of you ha may have these cube chairs in your classroom. Again, this is great for creating visual boundaries of where bodies are supposed to be positioned if a child has decreased body awareness. It also has that tactile input to, to give the bodies more input to know where their bodies are in space. Next are the flat back chairs, again, to improve that body awareness and also help with upright posture. These inflatables are some that were used in our circle time activities. You can see here in this picture the tactile components that can be used along with the subtle vestibular input. One side can be bumpy while the other side is smooth. And on the ones that are inflated with air, they can be more inflated or less inflated, um, depending on how much movement you want the children to have or how much movement their systems need. These next pictures show some alternative seating options. The one on the left with the large rubber band or TheraBand around the legs of the chair, again, to get that vestibular input um, in a very subtle, in a very quiet way. These work well for the kids who tend to um, need to move their legs or fidget their legs or fidget their feet. This can be accomplished using that TheraBand around the, the legs of the chair in a very quiet way so as not to um, interfere with what's happening in the classroom. The picture on the right with the therapy balls. So you even see these now with adults in offices. Um, the input that our vestibular systems, our sensory systems, receive 
from sitting on these balls, really elicits upright posture, facilitates um, good posture at a table, um, and gives that subtle vestibular input, again, for improving attention and focus. Fidget toys. So it's important to know these can be used not just at circle time, these can be used at all times during the day. And I gave some varying ideas here, some very economical ways that you can have fidgets in your classroom. Um, balloons filled with Play-Doh or filled with rice or filled with beans. Um, having the ch letting the child squeeze those, fidget with those, um, those are good stress relievers. The next picture are very similar ones that are available for purchase. And then the one on the right, just the idea that you could use anything that you might have in your home or your classroom, just some simple nuts and bolts and washers that can um, achieve the same results when we're talking about the fidget toys. So that last highlighted area that we're going to talk about is some classrooms are some classroom strategies to improve peer interactions. So there aren't any fancy pieces of equipment. Um, this is more where, where the teacher's job comes in with the interaction with the child, or also with creating um, safe spaces, creating a safe, small pairing with one child and another. So if you have a child whose cup is already full or maybe overflowing, we want to pair them with a peer who might be more quiet and gentle. Another idea is adult modeling. You want to imitate their positive behaviors. So if they're sitting, uh, sitting on the ground, playing with trains or rolling cars back and forth, you want to get down to their level and work on the engagement and imitate their behaviors because kids learn through imitation. And by modeling, we need to leave time and space for them to react and respond. So we don't want to overwhelm them with a lot of words, with a lot of directions, with a lot of commands. We want, might want to make a simple comment or add something to what their play is, and then just leave time, leave some space for them to react and respond. And then your next action, you can take the cue from what they're doing and interact with them. Um, lastly is the use of a preferred game or a toy to facilitate play and engagement. And it really helps to know what's motivating for our children. So I would encourage you to, especially at the beginning of the year or when you might get a new student, to talk to their families, talk to their parents, to find out what motivates them. And you could easily use their motivator to help facilitate play and engagement. If they really like Dora the Explorer and another child is playing with some blocks, you can possibly incorporate pictures of Dora the Explorer on the blocks just to get some, some more engagement, some more motivation to uh, make that child more, more inclined to play with their peers. So these are some specific sensory classroom strategies that can be used throughout your day. Um, again, not just at circle time or specific times during the day. Um, the importance of creating sensory and quiet spaces, allowing for movement breaks, and having sensory visuals in your classrooms. And these next slides will break down these three areas. So some ideas for sensory quiet spaces in our classrooms. I chose this picture because um, it really gives you the idea. It has the nice, nice soft pillows for that calming sense for the child to get into and tap into that proprioceptive sense for calming. But this one also creates a nice visual boundary. Um, it's separating out that quiet space where the pillows stop and where the tables and the desks begin. So it's a, it's a separate, safe, quiet space for them. Some other quick examples of things that can be used in your classroom 
between different chairs with soft pillows or actually using some tents with soft things in them. Um, in these tents, they work well uh, as sensory quiet spaces because the vision can be occluded, what's happening out in the classroom can be minimized. Uh, you could have some noise canceling headphones inside the tent to really decrease or eliminate the auditory distractions or the noise if the children are particularly irritated by those sensations. Here's a quick picture of an IKEA chair. So this has the built-in capacity to tap into the vestibular system because this chair spins around. So an adult can spin this chair around or a child, if their legs are long enough, can have their feet outside the chair and spin themselves around and control their own input. It also has the added feature of that cover, which can be a quarter of the way, a half of the way, or all of the way closed, again, to create that safe space and to minimize distraction. So the sensory visuals for the classroom. The key here is to have predictable spaces in the classroom so the children know what to expect. I talked earlier about um, the children possibly having rigidity and needing, um, needing to know what's coming next. So these sens sensory visuals can really be helpful in creating predictable places. Um, the, the icon for the bus on the bottom left, um, these, these different icons, you could use them, they could be cut into smaller pieces, you could have them hanging on a wall in your classroom, and a child can take them off and carry them. And if they're a nonverbal child, um, they might be able to use it as a form of communication or getting their needs met. Um, the bus icon that I was going to talk about, this would be particularly helpful for a child if they have difficulty with transitions. So as they're getting their shoes on and getting their backpack ready, getting their coats on to go home, if they're holding the icon, the picture of the bus, in preparation for this activity and possibly even carrying it all the way down the hall, and as they enter the bus, that can help that visual cue can help them know what's coming next. The movement breaks, or the sensory diet strategies. Um, I like to say here that even, of course, typically developing children, not just our children with ASD or sensory processing needs, it's important to have movement breaks consistently throughout the day and proactively throughout the day. It's not going to help the child or the classroom if you wait until a meltdown is happening to offer a movement break or to offer a sensory strategy. So these are some examples of icons or pictures that you could have hanging in your classroom or in a booklet in your classroom, and the child can have access to these pictures, being able to pick one um, based on their awareness of what their own bodies and what their own sensory systems are needing at a particular time. Um, this last one is just a picture of a break box, a sensory toolkit. And the ones that you use in your classroom don't need to be this fancy. It could be simply a box that you buy and you decorate or have the children help you decorate and have available in your classrooms. It could be filled with some of the weighted objects that I've talked about some of the fidget toys, it could have some um, noise-canceling headphones, you might have some tubes with some special aromatics or smells in them that also help for calming. And I did just refer to it, but it's important to note that all of these sensory strategies I've talked about, they can be used effectively with typically developing children as well. We're all sensory beings and we're all taking in sensations from the environment so we can all benefit from these sensory strategies. Um, just a final point, um, please note that these are, are general recommendations, and I can't say that they will help for every child, every autistic child, every child with sensory processing difficulties in your classrooms. If you have more specific challenges or more specific questions, you should be able to consult with an OT for some more specific 
recommendations and strategies that might help in your classroom. So finally, what did we learn? Hopefully, we learned about common characteristics and symptoms of autism. We learned about sensory processing and how it impacts the students in your classroom. And finally, how to create or begin to create an autism-friendly environment in your classrooms. So I have my contact information on the slides. Please feel free to share any questions that you have at further dates with me. And I also included some references for you. Bridget, thank you so much. This has been fascinating and, um, and really helpful. So thank you. Thank you so much for being our presenter today. Uh, we'd like to open up for questions. If anyone has any questions, please use the chat feature on the right side of the screen, and we will get to as many as we can. We know we have about 10 minutes left of this webinar. So one common question that we have here is, if I were to use a fidget toy or other sensory item in my classroom, won't all the kids want one or fight over them? That's a great question, and I get that a lot from the teachers. And one thing that I like to say, and what I hinted about at the end of this webinar, is that all children can benefit from these strategies, from the fidget toys, from the adapted uh, seats that we have in our classroom. So I don't want you to limit it to the child who might be having the difficulties. Have things available as you can throughout the classroom so that every child can be able to have access to it if they have the need. Um, the fidget toys in particular, teachers often ask me and think that if they give them a stress ball or give them something filled with Play-Doh, it's going to become a projectile. And it might, <laughs> but you have to establish rules in your classroom around the use of these fidget toys and sensory things. These rules can be um, talked about during the circle time. And once the novelty wears off with these, these new ideas and these new items in the classroom, the children really do begin to use them in the way they're intended. Great. So one other question we have here is, uh, what is the best way to talk with a parent about concerns or issues that you're seeing in the classroom? Yes, this is a tricky one <laughs> because, like I said earlier, you're the ones that are spending, as classroom teachers, as preschool teachers, you're the ones that are spending the majority of the time with the kids, and you're spending time in a very um, possibly chaotic, overwhelming environment with lots of other kids. So the parents might not be seeing the same concerns in their very familiar and quiet homes. So I would say just with, to the best of your ability um, to be able to talk with the parents about your concerns, possibly offer them a time to observe in the classroom. Um, very important to point out the child's strengths along with um, the challenges that you're seeing, and also to be able to provide uh, solutions for them. So you don't want to just present the problem. You want to be able to offer solutions. Um, and again, if it's outside of the bounds of your expertise, um, you should hopefully be able to reach out to an OT in your school system or a local OT who can be able to do a free screening or possibly a parent workshop to help you out with those parent questions. Great. So we have um, another question here. How do I help a child who uses vocalizations throughout the day, especially during circle time or group activities? Yeah, that's another great one. And those vocalizations throughout the day, especially during the circle time or group times, you know, those are very common uh, characteristics, common symptoms of children um, with ASD. So the best way to help them um, in a very generic sense, I would say, to start with those movement breaks. Um, start the day fresh or start before the circle time activity or start just be before that group activity that you're mentioning and provide a sensory rich activity. Maybe it could be as something as simple as running up and down the, the hallways. 
if you have a small trampoline, jumping on a trampoline to provide that vestibular burst, um, providing a nice big squeeze or a nice bear hug if you know that a child might be um, seeking that proprioceptive input, um, the use of fidgets. Again, just a very sensory rich environment, again, proactively. Don't wait until they're, they're um, vocalizing or don't wait until they're having that tantrum. Provide those sensory strategies frequently and often throughout the day. And this is a very similar question. Uh, what would you suggest to do for a child who spends most of their day screaming? Yeah, so that one's tough, not only for the child who's spending most of their day screaming, but for the other children in the classroom and certainly for the teachers. So this is definitely not um, not something that we want to see. Um, clearly something is, is going on with this child to, you know, again, if they're nonverbal, possibly they're not feeling well. Um, there might be something um, going back to a, a comorbid physical or medical problem that they're having that they're not able to communicate. So you would definitely want to speak with the parents about, you know, referrals or going to their pediatrician to make sure nothing is happening physically um, with them to make them so distressed. Um, you know, this one's very specific, this screaming. Certainly you could try some um, some sensory strategies, but my, my first guess is the simple sensory strategies are not going to stop all day screaming. So they might need a referral to a specialist. It might be best to start with a, telling the parents to talk with a pediatrician um, to see what they might recommend because they might have the whole picture um, and know what's happening physically with them. We probably have time for one more question. If there are any additional questions, uh, please use the chat feature. Thank you. Those have been great questions so far. Well, thank you all. And as a reminder, we will be circulating a link to a recording from today's webinar, and we will be sharing Bridget's contact information and the links that she provided as well. Um, and we will be also sharing information about a follow-up call in the spring when you have had a chance to try out some of these strategies and have some additional questions for Bridget uh, about what's working, what's not for you, and how you could continue modifying your classroom. So thank you again. Thank you very much for joining us and spending an hour of your time with us. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. And we will now officially close the webinar and hope you have a wonderful Thursday evening.